Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Advisory Council on Student Behavior and Discipline, I'm calling this meeting into order. May we please have a roll call, Mr. Green, Ms. Fair? Sure. Joanne Acor. Amanda Austin. Faith Boudreaux. Present. Rochelle Brown. Brenda Cosse. Alan Coulter. Mark Curry Dario. Amy DeVille. Tia Edwards, Mike Falk, Danny Gary, Liz Gary, Selena Gomez, Judge Gail Grover. Judge Grover uh, said she's going to be about 30 minutes late, so she should be on her way, but we're going to mark her as for now. Susan Harris. Lynn Hathaway, Raymond Jetson, Nicole Jolly, Michael Ortigo, Fran Perry is here, Lacey Palazzola, Brad Prudham, here. Tori Roca, here. Carolyn Romer, Al Simmons, Keisha Simmons, Lauren Winkler Here. and Allison Zimmer. And Ms. Coronda Corley. I'm present. We have somebody that's here that's not accounted for. I'm sorry. Who's, uh, are you serving as proxy someone for someone, or are you newly appointed to this council? Um, I'm a second representative from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Okay, and what's your name? Ashley Dalton. You said Southern Poverty Law? Thank you. Okay, and if we could, if everyone could please give an introduction so that we know who everyone is, but we're gonna do a friendly icebreaker. Okay, so in the spirit of the holiday, I like holidays. So I would like each person to introduce yourself and say what entity you're representing, but also say what your favorite food is during this time frame. So I'll start with you, Ms. Ebony. Developmental Disabilities Council, and my favorite food during the holidays, I would have to say, is macaroni and cheese. <laughs> you, you next, Mr. Rocker. Um, Tori Rocker, uh, I am with the school first, we can I'm sorry, Mr. Rocker. Could you speak up so the interpreters could hear you? My name is Tori Rocker. I am with Disability Rights Louisiana as the state's protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities. I am with public policy and engagement, and probably getting happy with my favorite food is a burrito. That would be you, Nick. I am Brad Prudhomme. I am an ICWA state president. I'm a child welfare and attendance. I represent that organization. And my favorite food is always steak. <laughs> <laughs> morning. My name is Lauren McClure, and I'm at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, uh, I think my favorite food has to be any of the desserts during Christmas time. Hi, I'm Ashley Dalton. I'm new at the Southern Poverty Law Center in the Children's Rights Unit. Um, since doing, this is my first time to this committee. Um, and my favorite food around the 
around the holidays, um, except they have the cabbages, but the kids, uh, Danish crinkle, the big circular pastries, probably don't mind, and live in a beer house in the brain. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Faith Boudreau. I'm the program manager for the Ellison School Health Program within the Department of Health. Um, my favorite uh, holiday food is pecan pie. And uh, any other dessert too. <laughs> Good morning again, everyone. I'm Theran Perry, representing the Department of Education. Uh, my favorite food over the holidays, I'm, you know, I'm, it's dessert. I, um, I'm a health fanatic, but I, you know, we get to eat sweets around the holiday season, so, and I take advantage of every opportunity I can get, so. Miss Nikki, we're gonna allow, uh, we're gonna make this a very friendly meeting to allow the public to be able to introduce, introduce themselves as well. Hi y'all, I'm Nikki Landry, I'm the Executive Director of Education Policy for the Department of Education, and seafood gumbo would have to be my Favorite. We'll be cooking that up on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Greetings. I'm Shalika Adams, and I'm the child welfare and attendance liaison for the state at LDOE. And my favorite food would have to be anything that I can recreate with Jackson. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Angie Jordan. I am the direct executive director of foundational skills for the Department of Education. And Nikki stole my idea, but my mom's gumbo is absolutely the best. And so any holiday or day I can get it is a good day. And the public? What we're doing is introductions of uh, who you are, who you're representing, and what your favorite food is for the holiday. Uh, my name is Craig Bilbrew, and I stand in for Dr. Susan Harris for the Louisiana Department of Educators. I am a teacher for East Baton Rouge Parish um, School, uh, Capitol Hill School. And my favorite food for the holiday will be cornbread dressing. My mom is cooking. Okay, and you're serving as proxy. Yes. If you could please come up to the table and have a seat um, at one, at uh, whichever seat you feel comfortable at, and just write your name on the um, template that we have provided with the dry erase marker. And we will great, and we greatly appreciate you for being here. Um, ASL interpreters. Oh, yes, so we are. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Katea. <laughs> I'm an ASL interpreter. And what's your favorite food for the holidays? Favorite food for the holidays? I was not expecting this. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I'd say enchiladas. Okay. Mo <laughs> oh, Annette Pouchon, um, here representing as an ASL interpreter through an agency. Um, favorite food is gumbo, any gumbo. <laughs> and my name is Karonda Corley. I am serving um, in the space of a parent of a child with a disability that has maladaptive behavior, and I am your chair for the council, and my favorite food would actually have to be fresh strawberry cake um, from Ambrosia's. Not advertising, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am so happy that everyone is able to come here today and be able to be a part of this council, um, and so we're going to go right on into the agenda. Um, can I please get a motion from someone on the council um, for the approval of the minutes of the meeting held on August 19, 2022? That's a move. Oh, okay, so the first motion. We have to receive that. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have a quorum to receive it. My, my apologies. But do I have a motion to receive the minutes from um, August 19, 2022? Is okay. First, uh, first motion by Miss Faith Boudreaux with LDH, and do I have a second? second? 
And who seconded? Ms. Lauren Winkler with uh, Southern Poverty. Okay. Um, the next item that we have is considerate. Any opposition? Oh, I'm sorry, do we have any opposition? Any abstentions? Hearing none, then the motion is uh, approved for us to receive those minutes. Um, next item is consideration of the status of the past and current council reports to the City Senate Committee on Education, House Committee on Education, and the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, I would like to allow LDOE to be able to speak on that. Sure. But first, can I have a motion to receive before Mr. Perry speak on it? Okay. First, uh, motion by Ms. Winkler. And do I have a second? Okay, and second by Mr. Rocker. Sure, guys, the, uh, the report, you can find it, the legislative report is in the most current one, December, uh, the legislative report is in your uh, folder. And basically this report is a summary of um, the challenges that the council endured during um, during the COVID season and the COVID crisis. So um, we all know that this council had a difficult time meeting quorum uh, throughout that that time. So what we've done was we pretty much summarized, uh, you know, what occurred in terms of those challenges, and uh, we assured that we are uh, going to. Uh, remain committed to working together to reach a consensus around um, the council's responsibilities. So um, we acknowledge that due to those challenges, we were unable to fill um, quite a few of our responsibilities during those years. So that's pretty much the gist of the um, 22, um, 22 report. Okay. Does anybody on the council have any questions or want to have a discussion in regards to it? Okay. Same people are here, and we don't meet quorums for going. My apologies. Yeah. Um, Mr. Uh, Prudon? Yes. Some 
start off with looking at that and then submit this uh, to the author legislature author who uh, brought this bill up in the state legislature. That's one of my opinions. Any other discussion from the the actual board? Actually, there was a resolution that was done during the legislative session regarding open meeting law um, to allow individuals um, to be able to attend meetings that fall up under open meeting law, to be able to attend virtually. Um, that resolution passed during this previous legislative session. It was um, uh, helped and pushed by the ARC um, so that individuals with disabilities could actually be able to have meaningful participation um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of that. Um, does anyone in the public would like to comment on topic number five uh, regarding the consideration of the status of past and um, current council reports to the Senate and House Education as well as the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education? Seeing no comments from the public, come back to the council. Um, do y'all have any other comments that y'all would like to make as it relates to that particular topic? And LDOE, please feel free to chime in. No, that, that's, um, as far as the report is concerned, um, again, the, uh, the legislative report, you know, again, pretty much summarizes, um, you know, the challenges that the council um, has endured. So. Um, yeah, there are some members, um, some council members are, um, that have consistently uh, not attended uh, uh, meetings. So um, that should be taken into consideration in terms of size of the council and, and uh, productivity. Okay, and just, so, and just in case anybody don't, is not aware, this council is a 29-member council. So if we are... With, if we're uh, if we're actually um, considering or actually taking uh, that, making that recommendation for the reduction in size of the council, how, what number are y'all proposing? My proposing number is based upon the amount of usually. Um, the quorum probably should be about nine. I have routinely seen you know, just under the 15 that we need for quorum sometimes. So um, usually we can seem to count on at least 10 people showing up. And there are, say, you know, there are several organizations that like they are consistently not sent for that people. Um, so probably like maybe getting us to a little over 10 would be more. We seem to consistently have about that. So you're recommending? Uh, I, would say, uh, I would just suggest for a proposal, that might be the right number, but I would say get this down to more than 20 people. Okay. Anyway. I think it's somewhere between 15 and 
A anyone else, Ms. Mr. Brudon? I think that's a good number, 215 and 17 days. That way we can reach out to them. Okay. Okay. Um, does do I have anyone that is not in approval with the recommendation? Do I have anybody that's in opposition? Any abstention? Okay, so that it will pass. The next um, item, item number six, is consideration of a discussion of Act 697 of the 2022 regular legislative session regarding school programs to prohibit and prevent bullying. Do I have a motion um, to discuss this? I move a motion to discuss number 697, which is reference to bullying in school. Do I have a second? Okay, and would y'all like to dis, um does anyone on the board have a comment or would LDA, LDOE I'd like to talk? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, this Act 697 was, you know, pretty much summarized last time and, and um, during our meeting and, uh, you know, Mr. Um, Frudem uh, asked that we dig further, a little further into it um, for this particular meeting. So the Act, um, uh, during the 2022 uh, regular legislative session, Act 697 was passed to address bullying. Specifically, this legislation uh, requires that all schools, including non-public schools, to institute a program to prohibit and prevent bullying. And then it requires those programs to define bullying, ensure that all stakeholders are aware of the duties and responsibilities relative to preventing and stopping bullying, to provide a process for reporting and investigating alleged bullying in incidents, to provide for appropriate remedies for a student found guilty of bullying, to provide for appropriate remedies for a student found to have been bullied. And here's the, the big um, point of this, um, this particular act, um, and it was um, iterated by Ms. Um, Chaz Romer, I think during the last meeting, is that the act also provides a process to investigate and report individuals who fail to act. So it leans uh, to the side of holding um, system employees um, are more accountable for failing to act uh, regarding bullying. Okay, Mr. Prudhoe. Okay, the reason why I, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up to discussion, and not everybody that works in the school system, um, there's a, I feel there's a problem. Let's look. You count your pages of page nine. And this letter triple I. It starts off with before any student under the age of 18 is interviewed. His parent or legal guard shall be notified by the school official of the allegation made and shall have the opportunity to attend any interview with his child conducted as part of the investigation. If after three attempts in a 48-hour period, the parent or legal guard of the student cannot be reached or do not respond, then the student may be interviewed. In school law, the administration of the school acts in the place of the parent. And no other incident, no other investigation, and it has been challenged all the way through the Supreme Court, that an administrator has to wait for a parent to interview a child. They can interview a student 
without the parent present. I do believe it's a good idea to get the parents involved, definitely to bring them in. But when we start waiting, after the report is given to the administration of a bullying incident, we may have to wait beyond a day. We have to wait two days, 48 hours, before we start the investigation. And here's this child who complained and is concerned, and we can't act on it. This is the only thing that prevents us. This is the only law that prevents us. So I, I would like someone eventually to bring this forward to the legislature and look at it. It's not that I don't want the parents involved. I, want, I am concerned about the safety of the student who is being bullied. And in this day and world, it takes a lot of time to reach a parent. Meanwhile, the student is still at school and feeling unsafe and feeling picked on. Uh, therefore, I would like this somehow to change where it would fit every other law we have in education that the administration can begin the investigation. I mean, I have administrators calling me, what do I do, you know? Um, I don't know for sure if this is bullying or not. I need to investigate. I can't question anybody. I gotta wait. Because I can't find the parent. This is what I wanted to bring into discussion. Okay. In, any other comments from the council? Mr. Uh, Mr. Craig? Yeah. Um, I don't see issue with them wanting the parent to be able to get in contact with the parent for the question before the question of the child. I don't know about taking it out completely. Maybe make it like a 24 hour time frame. But if 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 as a parent, if you're gonna talk to my child, child control, your dog work with the home system, the follow system, that's the norm. Thank you. If if you're gonna question my child or uh, do an investigation that's gonna possibly affect my child's entire future, I would like to, you know, be present. Now, I do get it. There are some parents that you come, you know, it virtually next to impossible to get in touch with them. But just to move it away to where you're just going to immediately start questioning my child, because sometimes they might say something and it's interpreted wrong. And then at that point, what what can you do? You can't take it back, or we might. I would rather err on the side of caution. Um, I don't support bullying at all. I, I think it, it's a serious problem, but I don't want us to override a parent's right and and their um, an opportunity for them to protect their child. Yes. Good morning. I'm Lisa Seven, and I support the bullying issue. Um, I First off, 48 hours is generous to reach a parent. That's a lot of time. Uh, so I would like to know how often does that occur. Uh, but for 42, does this also include, my question is, does this also include the child's ability to give a statement? Because while I may not be able to question the child, I can still, as an administrator, proceed with collecting statements. And so, 48 hours, and I've, I've worked in a you know, permanent setting, I took all of the, the whole gamut of, of uh, school climate, and typically we can reach an adult. We can reach, we can reach an adult. If we're going on that demographic page and we're looking at parents, we're looking at guardians, we're looking at emergency contact, we just need approval, right, from one of those individuals. And so you should be able to obtain that within Hours. But more importantly, if, if this does not um, alleviate this collecting of statement, the child is pretty much right now what he or she saw, then I don't see a problem uh, with that clause. Because I do agree, if you're starting to question a minor, engage a minor, you, that a parent does need to be present. A parent does need to be involved there. But the child should be able to give a statement. I mean, we collect statements all the time. I currently work as a behavior specialist, so my focus is behavior, and we do collect statements. So certainly we will notify parents before uh, any questioning starts. 
I feel like the inner the word interview is the infection hangout. It's left to interpretation. Right. So if the administrators right. are interpreting this clause to say they can't start their their investigation, that's a misinterpretation because that's not what it's saying. You can start your investigation. You just can't engage this minor in questioning because that can lead to some some legal issues. Right. Yeah. So I just don't agree. Yeah. Um, I've been in the school system for 40 years um, and, and, and many labors. First of all, I did state that in every other investigation, you do not need the parent. Do you hear me on that? In the school law, you do not need the parent. And that has been brought to court and appealed to court, and I'm saying you don't need the parent. What's another investigation for those of us who are not? Would anything that happens on school campus? Mm -hmm. Reported yes. on the state. Um, mm -hmm. you know, spoken, um, fight. Well, if the child mm -hmm. is caught with the faith, that's you're not necessarily yeah. investigating, you're not interviewing, that's pretty much cut and dry. Yeah. You know, the child is caught vaping, but still the parent is notified. The parent is notified. Well, the faith was not. It was reported okay. and we have to investigate. Right. And what happens typically in that case is the, the, the school administrators should reach out to the parents to, you know, if it was reported, then you can collect statements. If it was reported, if, if uh, Ebony reported that uh, Trey had faith, then the administrator can do a random search. Don't need parent permission to do a random right. search, right? You can do a random search. And you can start uh, collecting statements if need be. But if the random search shows there is no vape, then problem solved. If the random shows there is a vape, then you can proceed. You can you can proceed with disciplinary action and then explain to the parent if after the investigation we find that no suspension is warranted, we can rescind the suspension. So you know you don't necessarily you know the parent in this case no no rights are being violated. But the parent was not five. Okay, so, so we'll continue. Yeah. Um, Any other discussion? You, oh, I'm sorry. When uh, considering uh, this, uh, this tax clearance, bear in mind that um, the Kisikaki, I don't want to rely on that entirely because uh, the bottom five lines of text are cut off. So you want to go to the legislative website and actually look at the bill on there. It's missing some, uh, some language at the bottom of the page. Uh, what about the text that we're discussing? Uh, Are they clear? The second, well, that, that language is up. It's towards, it's towards the top of the eight, so I think that's fine. Okay, all right. It's scary. Yeah. 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 There's also three, it's just missing it. Five lines at the top of the image. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. So, and go ahead, Mr. Perron. Do you have a report? I have a student rights out of the report. Okay. And we're trying to find the pen. Um, have you ever interviewed a student when the parent is sitting next to them? First of all, if we can't get them right away to two, the student goes home, collaborates with the parents, and then comes back and the story changes. Or a student many a times don't know what to say because they're afraid of their parents' reaction. I mean, you, they depend on their parent, okay? We're just trying to get a clean cut story to see what happened so that we can help out the situation, help the student who is bullying another student, you don't get into counseling and explain everything, and the victim. I just think that it should be a little shorter time for sure, than 48 hours. Um, I think it should be that you notify the parents, call them and let them know that you're about to interview a student, that's fine. Well, you could do that, like if, if you call the parent and let them know that there's been some accusations made against their child, mm -hmm. they can give you that permission on the phone and say, it's okay, you can talk to him, or I'm off tomorrow morning, I can come in and talk. It's not saying that you have to wait 48 hours. It's saying that if you can't get in touch with the parent, 
then after the 48 hour time period has expelled, uh, has expelled, then you can move forward with the question and talking to the parent if you made at least three attempts. I'm so, aware of that. We, we right, are aware of that. Right, no, but I'm just saying. Have so, you ever worked with the school system? I work now. Yes. Yes, I, and I, I'm doing it now. And my thing is, I understand what you're saying, and, and bullying is a serious thing, but at the same time, we don't want to violate anybody's rights. You know what I'm saying? Because if we all know as well, the reason why they put the 18-year-old age on there is because of the, the age of consent and being an adult, because you can question somebody or you can talk to them. I mean, just the basic tactics of being a waiter in a restaurant. If I want to sell you mushrooms at your steak, I just say, you would like some mushrooms and nod my head and smile and you're thinking, okay, yeah, and then you can leave them. So if it's a child that's 11 or 12 years old and I'm a coach or an, I'm an intim intimidating figure and there's no one there that I trust that can protect me, then I might say what I feel like you want me to say or I'll go down the path that you're just right in front of the camera. And then after I said it, then the first thing you will say when my mom show up or if we have to get a lawyer is, well, this is what he confessed to me. But what under what conditions did I confess? Under what condition did I testify? You know? So I just want to make sure that because I've been, um, we've been doing investigation that we get bullied in all the time. Not all the time, but a lot. There are some times where it's not even actually a case of bullying. You know, now there are often times, unfortunately, that it is bullying, but sometimes it's not, you know. So in, in that instance, we could have somebody that is wrongfully, you know, and once, once this go on your record, and this is not like next year you get a clean record or when you move on, these things are going with them for 18 and 20 years that's standing on their record. And this is something that could affect scholarships, it could affect their ability to participate in a lot of programs. So in our haste, I do not want us to wrongfully convict somebody. You know, now I agree with you that 48 hours is a long time. I'm thinking maybe 24 hours, because if you have the accurate and correct phone numbers of the school that your child is attending, we should be able to get in touch with you at the drop of a hat. But take into consideration that everybody has various work schedules and work jobs and availability. So we will give you a 24 hour, you know, chance to call us back. But to just do away with it totally, I don't know. And um, and I appreciate that because as I look at it, um, being a parent of a child with a disability that have maladaptive behavior that is not verbal, that communicates with American Sign Language and a communication device, it is my right to be able to speak on behalf of my child, just like in a juvenile court, you have them speak on behalf of the juvenile. Um, 48 hours to me, I don't feel would be a, a it, I don't feel that that's not a, a long time frame, especially if you look at a weekend. If the if the incident occur on a Friday, then you know that that 48 hour time frame extends to the following week. I do, however, have quite a few questions as I read this 15 page law in regards to many, many, many different things. Um, especially as it related to um, violating the children's civil rights um, as it relates to those with disabilities. We do know that OSEP has been rolling out more things um, as it relates to children, and I'm, I'm just curious about that because I did not see any consideration as it related to children with disabilities, um, specifically those with uh, IEPs and those with 504 plans. I did not see anything as it related to that. I also wanted to know how um, how do we expect the staff to be able to do four hours of training when they are already tasked with doing so much professional development uh, prof professional development training as as it relates already. I know right now some of the school systems, some staff are required to do so much training that they're not even able to enjoy their breaks their Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, spring break, or any other break that they may have because they're doing training. And the staff is not being compensated when they're doing that training on their free time. So I, I do, uh, then that brings in EEOC. 
as it relates to them doing work and training and not being compensated by pay for doing training that's required for their work. So I do have questions with that, but also it doesn't state a date or a uh, timeline in when that training is to be completed. Um, in addition to all the other trainings, I also saw um, questions. I had questions in regards to reasonable time frame. I could say a reasonable time frame is two years from now. That don't mean that it's actually a reasonable time frame for you. So I think that that needs to be defined. And as and I know that Mr. Perry can tell you because he's sitting right here next to me that I have comments on just about every single page on things that I had questions to as it relates to this, especially with um with the injunction to actually remove um, the custody to actually go forward and the consideration in regards to what the training would look like as it relates to those with disabilities. I know that training for um, staff as it relates to CPI is very different when you do CPI training as it relates to a child with a disability that may have autism. Uh, and as it relates to a child that has Tourette's, as it relates to a child that is nonverbal, as it relates to a child that is deaf and blind, all of those CPI trainings are different when you go to, as it relates to the different disabilities. And this law to me is just so vague that it leave it open. And so I, I'm just wondering if anybody um, ever considered thinking about how this, can, how we can make it apply to all children, but be uniform, system-wide for those in the state. And if don't nobody else have comment, then I would, uh, you know, on the board, then I would definitely allow the public to uh, chime in. I'm a little bit unclear as to what is it that we're attempting to accomplish with this law? I guess I'm trying to figure out, are we trying to make recommendations for changes to this? Is that, or are we just reviewing? Maybe it's Christmas fall, I don't know. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what are we trying to do right now? <laughs> okay. We can't do anything right now, we're just reviewing it for the going now. So we're reviewing it. All right. Yeah, so um, this has gone to legislation already? Yes, this, this is this, already this passed. It's passed. It's passed. It's passed. Yeah. It's passed. Right, that's what, that's what I thought. So yeah. are we attempting to submit recommendations? I'm still unclear. Maybe I just don't get the legislative process. Yeah, I, I can, um, I can uh, take you back up. Okay. During the last meeting, we um, you know, gave an update on the, you right. know, the legislative act. And, um, and for this particular legislative act, uh, Mr. Uh, Pruden just wanted us to dig a little more deeply into, um, you know, this particular act just to, um, to I guess, to see if we were uh, in agreement, Mr. Prudem, or, or uh, to shed light on that particular point that he made about the timeline and, um, and you know, to try to um, express his uh, thoughts about, you know, the specific timeline and the challenges that may come about um, as a result of that um, that timeline from his perspective. So that's kind of, um, that's where we are. So as a committee, our role is, so once we, let's say we all, just for sake, we say, okay, we think 24 hours is a better timeline, would that be possible and like, I guess yeah. that's what I'm trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah, what, what can occur is, um, is you know, we, this committee is responsible for writing a, um, well, the chair is responsible for writing a legislative report at the end of um, each year. So what can, uh, the perspective of this committee can be included in that particular report um, uh, specifically about um, this particular um, leg piece of legislation. Yes, we, we, uh, we can let our views be known uh, via that report concerning this particular piece of legislation. Yes, Mr. Prudhoe. Uh, 17416, that is the law 17416, it's like the Bible of discipline, okay? And this committee worked on 
revising this law for years. Um, we had even a legislative committee, which I was on, and a subcommittee to break down the whole law in, in sections. And then it came back to our advisory uh, committee. And finally, after years of debate, we came to an agreement. Then that document was given to a legislature who would look at it and decide that he went to endorse it. Okay? And then it was brought uh, to the um, legislature uh, for possibly passing it. And then there's layers in the legislature before it becomes a law. Okay? And the last thing I want to say, whoever adopts this um, idea that we have, they can change it the way they want. That senator or that representative can readapt it again. So what I'm trying to say, yes, the 17-416 has come from, came from this the changes. Any other discussions with the council? Any public comment? Yes, can, uh, can you please stand, introduce yourself, um, who you're representing, if you're representing any entity or organization, and um, please be mindful that you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, come back to the council. Do anyone on the council want to have further discussion in regards to it? Any recommendations? Well, I do. I certainly uh, agree. And thank you for your comment. There is certainly some opportunity for uh, the local schools to properly follow the protocol that is put in place. Uh, and as she stated, those documents are on the weekend, I believe. If you click on the bulletin, uh, the link, in fact, you can just put bullying in the search engine. And everything comes up, the letter that you need to, the, the form that you need to, the, well, the questionnaire that you need to uh, talk with children regarding bullying, the letter that you need to send home, uh, the stay away agreement, all of those documents are in place. I mean, she's absolutely correct. The, the state lays it out as to what administrator, how administrators need to handle uh, those cases. So I'm not sure, you know, what uh, power we have as a council, but there is certainly some room. I know even in my own own district and other districts that you know we support through the association. And bullying is one of those things that we do get a lot of calls on. You know, school counselors just want to know their role in supporting administrators in it. And so, yeah, there's a there's the role. And I, I do want to add that um, even as far as the uh, the accountability piece for individuals who fail to act, the um, 
you know, it is a part of that, that act that um, there's a report that the department has to um, compile um, at the end of each school year that in which um, systems would have to identify, um, you know, how many reports of bullying um, or how many individuals within that system failed to act, mm -hmm. right, and the consequence for that. So that may speak to that, uh, that accountability piece that you were inquiring about. So that's, that's new. That's new and, and that's being compiled uh, really as, as we speak. So, um, so which, is, um, which is tightening that accountability piece on, on, uh, on systems. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing that uh, for those of you who work directly with schools and school administrators, um, I've seen this work really well um, in county parents a number of those schools will assign an assistant principal dedicated to bullying. So that one person, and it's not, I'm not saying that's all they do, but the, and the bullying investigations are centrally located with that person. And so if you want to make a recommendation, I can't say that I've seen that work and I've seen it work very well. So whenever somebody calls out bullying up, let me, let me transfer you to, to Ms. Johnson. You know, he handles bullying or she handles bullying. And, and by having that, having bullying centrally located, as you can imagine, the process is a little bit more streamlined, right? The questions to, the answers to your questions are probably more likely uh, there because they are the person that's conducting the investigation and following the group. So that's something to, to think about. Um, so I have a question. So the system that you were talking about, Mr. Perry, where the schools, is it the school systems that are reporting like the bullying events? And yes. so it's self-reporting. Yes, it is the um, the fresh <laughs> on on the um, on the that same note. Um, a system is being in terms of parents um, can also um, contact the department okay. and uh, you see so there the check and balances uh, system as far as that's concerned also so um, so yeah yeah I think Mr. Perry what you're saying which happens is that the parents not satisfied with the investigation and the outcome they can call the state department. absolutely and then they will they will call the district so therefore, if that, you know, if I'm a district, a system, and I say that I have zero reports, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but as a department, well, that doesn't best. We have seven here, so that's, that would require some, um, some conversation. You, you, you see, it's, so that's, there's a checks and balance system, which, again, it's, it's new, but it, it, it um, you know, it does, um, you know, tighten the grip of accountability so that we can, um, you know, address bullying in, in the most uh, productive way as, as, as we know how at this point. So, okay, I have a follow-up oh, that's fine. So, are there procedures or policies where parents can go and access that information if they feel like an investigation of bullying wasn't handled correctly? Is there a procedure where they can go and find and yeah. say, okay, these are the steps that I need to take in order to get in touch with the department to tell them I'm not satisfied with the investigation that they conducted. If I'm not mistaken, there should be a bullying webpage um, that has documents. Is that right, Ms. Simmons? Those documents that are, that, are, that are outlined, um, and they're pretty thorough. Yeah, they're yeah, it's very, thorough. very thorough. It is. And you can just put in bullying in the search and it'll take you right through it. From your list of documents, you'll see that the school, the documents for the school, but if you continue to search through, you'll see them all. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot, but, it, but, it, but it's good that it's thorough and, and um, it's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions or comments um, regarding this topic? 
Do I have any abstention um, as it relates to this motion? Any opposition? Okay, hearing none, the motion moved. Now we're going to item number seven, um, consideration of an update report um, regarding the sustainable community school model from Louisiana Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. Do I have a motion? It's a presentation. But do I have a motion to receive this presentation? So moved. A motion by Mr. Perry. Do I have a second? Second. Yes, ma'am. On X six ninety seven, to discuss it. Just to discuss. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just to discuss. It. Okay. Just want to make sure. A lot of thought for that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, just, just for clarity, Thank item you. number Thank six you. was right. was to discuss. Thank yes, sir, Mr. Prudhomme. So wait, let me let me go back. Let me go back. So are y'all saying that y'all wanted to bring have this uh, discussion be brought back to the a future meeting as it related to um, Act 697? Well, and I, I'm not necessarily saying that. Um, I just wanted I just wanted clarity. Um, okay. Mr. Cooper was explaining that if we had a form, we could have voted. And so I do agree with, um, and we need to decrease the numbers, you know, to those who do participate. I know that we've had some gaps in participation, but that gap has been filled, and so I do plan to uh, be here consistently. Right? So, um, you know, I, I agree with the numbers. I understand how boards work, and you do need a form in order to get some real work done. So, yeah, these are not coming to do that. Okay. So we voted on that, though, right? Because yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify for all those that are maybe attending virtual and those in the public that we only, that on item number six, because uh, the discussion on Act 697, it was only a motion to discuss it. That was the, that was what we did. So now to um, item number seven, um, our presenter uh, will come up um, for the presentation on sustainable community school models. And this is from Louisiana Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. And it was first, um, it was motioned by Mr. Perry and second by Mr. Bruno. I'll check, I'll come up there. Or I, can... I can just control your slides for you. Oh, thank you. Okay, again, um, is it better if I'm just stand here? Okay. <laughs> again, hi everyone. I'm Maria Harmon, one of the co directors for Step Up Louisiana, and we're one of the core partners for Louisiana Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. Um, I've been involved with this coalition since 2017, and the main objective is to expand the sustainable community school model throughout local school districts in Louisiana. And you can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> and essentially, community schools are um, a holistic approach to public education. Uh, it, it pretty much is a uh, strategy uh, utilized to improve neighborhood schools. And any public school can take on this model. First, you have to have a community school coordinator. They administer the uh, needs assessment, which is the second piece, which is uh, compasses grassroots visioning, where we approach sustainable community schools as a ground-up approach. So we want not only the school administrators and the principals, 
but we also want the teachers, we want the parents, we want community members, we want students part of the decision making process and part of the vision. Uh, the third piece uh, calls for grassroots and grass tops problem solving to achieve the vision. So of course the grassroots folks are your community partners like Step Up who organizes parents, um, other community groups who do similar work as well or youth-led organizations. Also, your teacher staff, your teachers' unions, all collaborating together um, to achieve a holistic vision. And for uh, the fourth piece calls for stakeholder and partner coordination. So um, it's more so a collaborative approach because it is the partnerships that really help with the viability of the model operating at a certain school. And to be more specific, how we define sustainable community schools, um, Step Up Louisiana in partnership with the Louisiana Association of Educators, and um, thanks to our national partners, the National Education Association, um, they, we have developed a six-pillar model approach to community schools. So the first pillar calls for strengthening curriculum and academic programs. So essentially, it's culturally relevant uh, curriculums and culturally relevant pedagogy. And the second piece calls for highly qualified teaching. And that's where the partnership from the teachers union comes in because they have the resources to provide professional development for teachers to have the approach necessary and support to not only approach education from a holistic standpoint, but also be culturally competent to be able to interact with students from different cultural backgrounds. The third piece calls for a coordinated and integrated wraparound supports. And that's the piece I'm gonna dive in much more deeply with this presentation with y'all. Because these wraparound supports not only provide health care, eye care, but they also provide social and emotional services. And social and emotional learning along with restorative justice practices really helps with intervention with where our students are in regards to student discipline and student behavior. Uh, the fourth piece calls for positive behavior practices such as restorative justice. So if you see the third pillar and the fourth pillar really work hand in hand together. Uh, the fifth piece is transformational family, student, and community engagement. So I remember we were discussing Act 697 with the issue of engaging parents. Well, this model actually helps with transforming those relationships where parents actually see themselves as shareholders or stakeholders in their school because the decision-making process is that uh, intentional with requiring their leadership to make sure the school's vision come to life. And then, of course, the sixth pillar calls for shared leadership philosophy, which is pretty much inclusive leadership. So we're talking about the principals, the teachers, the students, and the parents all making decisions at that specific school site. Thank you. <laughs> the wraparound supports in community schools, and this is from EvolveTreatment.com, um, which is a great resource that explains how wraparound supports are infused in community schools. But there are 10 things that are necessary in uh, making sure that you utilize the right approach with making sure you are seeking services to meet the needs of students. So first, it has to be strength-centered with family involvement. You have to consider the parents of the needs as well in, in, in identifying partners to provide services. The second piece is team-oriented, which means you can't make decisions for the people we serve. You have to make decisions with them. The third piece is adaptability of resources and services. So based off of a needs assessment, the results that come from it, you'll determine what are high priorities, what are lower priorities, or even goal setting. Uh, the fourth piece calls for personalized programming, which means that not every community school is gonna look the same because every community has different needs. And those needs are customized for those specific people at that school, even the people that live around the school. The, uh, I forgot my number, but the next one is resilience. <laughs> um, and, and really, the resilience comes from the community building that we have. I mean, real transformational relationships are had where some parents and students start to identify their purpose. You know, because th there are some community schools that even provide job placement, uh, continuing education for parents at some community schools. Uh, results oriented, which means that it's going to yield positive results. And we're going to go more into that, but we have seen uh, consistent positive results based off of evidence-based practices. 
in regards to wraparound supports and how they've been able to impact community schools. It's also community centered, culturally sensitive and aware, which marks off the first pillar. You know, um, so just to give an example, and I'll touch later on it, but when I saw a program come together in Capitol Elementary about four years ago for the school to start off with this thing called Harambe. And Harambe is Swahili for come together. And this school is predominantly African American. And I noticed everything about it. The principal had the staff in her hand, and we know the elder holds the staff. <laughs> and she, it was just, everything just came together, and it was like a beautiful thing to see because you also saw joy centered. I mean, these children are between the ages of five and 10. It's an elementary school. so. If you've seen the intention that was set there, because also the culture of the school also determines the school climate. And then the last two pieces touches on organic support systems and collective and collaborative. So if you, if these ten things are not encompassed with identifying partners to provide wraparound supports, those are not the partners you need to go with. <laughs> but uh, on to the next slide. And of course, um, I had to include this, but. The wraparound supports do not just center around the school. They follow the kids at home. It's a holistic approach. So we have to be mindful about that revolving door, that ever evolving cycle, because at the end of the day, to be able to develop children in a proper way, you have to have continuity and stability. And those wraparound supports are supposed to do that. And these are just some examples of restorative justice programs, um, which is encompassed with uh, wraparound supports. And just some examples, and I pulled this from uh, the Colorado school system because they're utilizing these things as well. But just for example, if an infraction has happened, whether it's graffiti or property damage, of, of course a punitive measure would be to refer them to law enforcement or in that way, they are matriculating through the juvenile justice system. You know, it's, it's a clear track way to uh, school to prison pipeline. But a restorative approach would be, you know, when you mess that up, go clean it. You help clean it or repair or, and I'm sure they would be learning from what they actually did. Uh, another example is gossip, bullying, interpersonal conflicts. Many times, some students would have to resort to detention or suspension even. What a restorative approach would be is for them to write a letter apologizing for what they did. And also, it would cause a lot of self-reflection within that child because they have to understand, why, why am I saying I'm sorry? You know, there's a lot of transformation that could be done and a lot of restorative work to be done there. And then also, there's room for reconciliation to be had between both students who were in conflict. A third example is classroom disruption. Well, how this is where the supports from highly qualified teaching <laughs> show up because some teachers may be overwhelmed, they may not know how to approach that situation. But if they have the proper supports and training, they'll be able to approach this from a standpoint of having the teacher in a being with the student and say, hey, you need to apologize. Let me talk to you after class. Hey, you were a bit interruptive, disruptive. Not only are you taking away time from yourself, but other students in the classroom as well. You know, and actually having that restorative conversation. And really, you can make it a situation where they're being held accountable, but also let's follow up. Let's give ourselves a time frame to see, um, work together and seeing how you can improve. So these are just different examples of restorative justice practices. And there's a list of other examples on that website as well, but it's a good place to start. <laughs> and also, the impact of community schools, again, um, they have a proven success rate. In Hillsborough, Florida, these are a list of schools who actually took on the community schools model um, in the school year of 2019. And Gibson, Gibsonton Elementary, in 2018-2019, their school year, they had 29 Suspensions. And with putting in the community schools model, which encompasses the wraparound supports, the restorative justice, they were able to decrease their uh, school suspensions by down to nine. That's a significant drop. It's a 69% drop. In Foster Elementary, they started off with 53 suspensions. They ended the year with the model at 28, 47% drop. Greco Middle, 
695 out of school suspensions. They dropped down to 459. 34% drop. Now, not every school is going to, they might need some work. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like that's where assessments come in. That's where evaluations and inclusive decision making come into play. So either way, we know that they're still trying. But to see the other schools have the significant drops really speaks to the effectiveness of the model. And here we are in Cincinnati. There was a local school, um, Lois, uh, Lower Price Hill. And in 2000, they didn't have any community schools. But then in 2019, they increased their presence to 44. And the achievement gap in 2000, the black student to white student achievement gap was about 14.5%. After including the community school model and having it implemented, that achievement gap has dropped to 4.5%. Graduation rate started off at 51%. After having the model, it increased to 79.4%. And we all know that student behavior and discipline impacts the graduation rate as well. And uh, the dropout rate even as well. Like it was at 85% and it dropped down to 80% in 2019 with 40% of the children on a track to go to college. And this is the MLK Middle School in San Francisco, California. So after implementing the model within a three-year difference, starting out, uh, they increased their English learning scores by 9%. They increased their math scores by 9%. And we know, once kids know that they're smart and they're proving that they work, like their self-improvement, their self-esteem is going to increase. How they treat each other, how they behave and show up all makes a difference. Uh, discipline referrals started off at 2,128, and now they have decreased to 175 three years later. Uh, suspension started off at 118, and they have decreased to 60. That is a significant drop. And um, at the beginning, only 9 out of 23 teachers were retained at MLK. Now, it's in, well, three years later, in 2018, 22 out of 23 teachers were retained. That is a very significant <laughs> uh, difference. And only 30 students received additional supports in 2015. After 2018, over 380 students are receiving additional supports, be it academic, health, and mental supports. Mental health supports. That's part of the wraparound supports pillar of sustainable community schools. And when you see the increase, 350 more students three years later are being served, which means they are utilizing the program, they're implementing the, uh, the model properly, and they're seeing effective results coming out of it. And here is just a, a chart graph of showing it's the same school, but just to see the dramatic decrease and them showing, hey, this is when the community school model was implemented. <laughs> and as you can see for yourselves, like it, it's, it's gone down to, from what, over 118 suspensions down to 16? That's a significant drop, which means this model is working and it's effective. So here, I um, just wanted to discuss just some research that was done on the uh, outcome of the community school model being implemented at Capitol Elementary in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on Gus Young Avenue. And it's located in a community called Eden Park and in the 70805 zip code. And this community is predominantly black, predominantly low income. And it's also, we have to consider the other stemming factors that can attribute to poverty or systemic racism. And with that, this school was put in a Innovation Network Schools cohort under the uh, East Baton Rouge Parish School District. And at the time, Dr. Quintina Tamal was one of the associate superintendents, and she did a great job of giving cover to this uh, cohort and uh, seeing that this program be implemented. And Capital Elementary, I believe, was the only school that took on the Sustainable Community Schools model. And uh, within that, they actually were the highest performing elementary school in their cohort amongst the other 50 schools. So 
So as you can see in their results, um, Capital Elementary and Capital Middle both had the same parents. So you had parents who had children that were in the younger grades and uh, their children that were in the older grades. Now Capital Elementary was the only school that took on the model, but Capital Middle still benefited, the, uh, benefited from the parents having their needs met from the model happening at Capital Elementary where they were able to impact the school performance scores and both Capital Elementary and Capital Middle actually both outpaced the schools in their cohort. So in conclusion, I'll just read uh, the objective analysis using peer groups that compare the uh, school performance score from Capital Elementary and Capital Middle to the other schools that were in that cohort. It definitely demonstrated that both schools have been significantly more successful at improving their students' performance score than other schools. Capital Elementary actually improved their school performance score by five points in one year's time. And as a result, they received two awards from the state. They got an AP Progress Score Award, and they also got a Top Gain School, school Award from the State Department of Ed. So, uh, yeah, this model is effective. Uh, they said uh, from the report that they ranked around the 50th percentile, and uh, actually that is a 25% uh, increase from where they were, and this 100-fold difference is a strong indication that the strategies being implemented at these schools merit a closer investigation. So we were actually, when the model got interrupted because of COVID and a change in leadership in East Baton Rouge Parish, we got a new superintendent. Uh, we shopped this data around. We presented it to so many people and we actually got buy-in from the superintendent to resume the model at Capital Elementary and it's going to expand the Capital Middle. So that's one good news I can share with y'all that this model is being implemented, especially in the coming school year. So we're excited to see the growth in what the data can show with the, effective, with the effectiveness of the model and how we can hopefully expand this throughout EBR Parish and other local school districts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, does anyone um, on the council have any questions or comments um, as it relates to the presentation? Yes, Mr. Bruno. Mr. Perry, can you you can share it sure. with our sure. council members? Sure. Okay. Any other questions, comments, um, or discussion, Ms. Boudreaux? So, um, currently, I'm the program manager for the Allison School Health Program for the state, and we uh, operate school-based health centers across the state. So, I guess I'm curious to know the, the difference between them, or I guess I see similarities. But um, specifically related to the health and behavioral health component, um, can you talk a little bit about that? I sure can. Um, so there's like different, uh, the reason why I went through those 10 points is because the model has to encompass those principles, I guess you could say, or values. So um, two uh, premier programs on office like ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, like they have a framework you can utilize and work with partners that subscribe to that. There's also multi-tier support. So I know multi-tier support is uh, something that's in place now from the school district, and it's also something that Ms. Paula Johnson, the principal at Capital Elementary, utilized as well. So those are two main things I know of. That, um, and also it's the skill set of the community school coordinator as well with identifying partners, because with the health component, she was able to build a relationship with the physician uh, called Mayo's Clinic. They were right across the street from the school. And uh, she built a relationship with them where they're, they were providing, I don't know if they're, she's probably going to revisit that, but they were providing preventative health care services. Thank you. I'd just like to say that I can uh, thank you again for your, for the uh, presentation, just uh, how the data, uh, I'm a, a data person, uh, and, um, and just seeing how addressing those needs through wraparound services, uh, 
um, impacted that those academic outcomes. Um, that those numbers were impressive, and and, and um, just to see that speaks volume of, of the community school model. Thank you. And I'll also add uh, the multi-tiered program that you mentioned that we have in the Louisiana Department of Education. Um, it's not the only Yes, Mr. Uh, Gray. Um, the community school model, uh, how does that relate to the, uh, the school choice and the banking program? In my personal opinion, it's kind of like a versus or a either or. And um, I heard you speak about it being implemented at Chap Capital Middle School in the coming year. But then I believe that the last school board was voted down. And yeah, the resolution was voted down. Yeah. I was one of the people that brought forward that resolution. So the resolution was mainly developed to create a strategy that the school district buys into where a community school steering committee would have been established where we would have actually operationalized that component where we would have been able to expand the model a bit more freely with like an intake process because the steering committee could oversee those applications. And also, you can create peer-to-peer -peer learning where Ms. Johnson can share knowledge with other principals on, that could be part of the community who wants to take the model on. Or Dr. Jackson can do peer-to-peer -peer relational, you know, building with other community school coordinators who want to come on board. And it also would have called for the teachers, the parents, and community members to be part of this committee. But uh, at the time, one of the school board members said that resolution was too prescriptive. And he didn't want to tie the hands of the superintendent, but we're thankful that the attention of the model, due to Ms. Johnson still being there, we're going to see it implemented with fidelity. That's one thing for sure. I'm glad that it, they're going to keep the model at just those two schools for now, but we do plan on bringing that resolution back again in the next year. It's unfortunate we're going to have a whole new school board working, but hopefully it gets done. In, any more discussion, um, comments, or questions regarding the presentation from the board? Um, Ms. Harmon, can you please speak about the resolution that the state has as it relates to the sustainable community okay. school model? Sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. So we did work with uh, Step Up Louisiana and the Louisiana Association of Educators. We were successful in getting state resolution 133 passed in May of 2018 which is a policy that the State Department of Ed adopted, which makes the community schools model an option for schools that need a comprehensive support or improvement. So um, it's on, it's suggested. It's not like a mandated model that people have to take on because there's other improvement models you can choose from. But uh, at first, we had to adjust the language because uh, it didn't have, the people at the Department of Ed at the time were comfortable saying the option. They said, can you make it an option? So uh, with that adjustment, we were able to get that passed. And it passed through uh, the state Senate committee and also the state uh, Senate floor and back in 2018. Can you repeat that one? Uh, SR-133. In any other? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, what I wanted to share was thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I got a chance to, to really learn about community schools at a conference last year and how 
how it relates to the work that I do as a uh, child welfare attendant. And what I can say is that community schools, that type of, uh, that the whole, as a whole, and when it's worked with fidelity, it actually increases attendance um, because it captures all of those um, unique barriers to attendance that kids have to go through when their families deal with it. It addresses that with all the community wraparound services. And I was glad when uh, Faith spoke up because when I sat in that meeting, they talked about how they, they have the uh, mental health and physical health component within their community schools. So the, the school was the actual hub of the community. So students didn't have to get checked out to go do a physical, the physical happened right in the school. And students didn't have to, if a parent was in need of groceries, the family didn't have to go to an outside vendor. They actually came to the school and, and, and signed their paperwork and was able to get a box to take to their home. So these are things that are things that act as a barrier to attendance um, that you see like outside of the school or actually being addressed at the school. So I love the model. I do. And I see how it helps, especially with the work that we do. I know with CWAs, we look for, uh, we look for ways to address barriers to attendance, and it starts with being restorative. It starts with being proactive. And when you're a community school, you're actually being proactive. You're allowing the, the, the uh, resources to already be there and be identified. And the only work that you have to do is to identify those that are at risk that don't know. You know, if you're doing it properly, they know that it's there. <laughs> But making sure that those connections are being made. Thank you for your Any more comments? And thank you for that comment. Any other uh, comments, discussions um, from the board? Um, now, any comments or questions um, from the public? Okay. Seeing none, do, do I have any abstention? Um, regarding this motion to receive this presentation. Let me make sure I clarify that for y'all. Any abstention um, regarding receiving this presentation? Okay. Any opposition regarding receiving this presentation? Okay. So the motion moves uh, to approve this presentation and each uh, council member, you shall receive the PowerPoint presentation um, via email um, from Mr. Perry. So please anticipate that and I hope that um, you find that information beneficial. And just a sidebar, it is the sustainable community school model is one that embodies children of all abilities, disabled and not, gifted, talented, magnet, or regular ed. It actually provided the resources for all. And so that's uh, one of the reasons why I wanted this presentation to be provided to each and every person here. So now our next topic is um, item number eight, uh, consideration of receiving um, the update on the report regarding the status of the school master plans for improving student behavior and discipline. Do I have a motion to receive it? Motion by Mr. Perron. Do I have a second? Second. A second by, Ms. by Judge Grover. Nice to see you, Judge Grover. Thank you, and I apologize. Yeah, I informed him that you were going to be reporting just a little late, so. Late <laughs> <laughs> And. That's Mr. Perry, if you can uh, please speak um, on this topic first. Sure. Guys, uh, this, this is, you know, I guess there's no action that can be taken on this, but um, I was thrilled to know that the school model uh, master plan for discipline is being, still being utilized by, um, by systems and, um, and thus, um, you know, we've gotten some recommendations regarding the um, model master plan. And, and these recommendations come in the form of cosmetic recommendations, but then um, we want to be certain that what we put out there for districts to use 
that is that is updated. I mean, because um, they um, we got some feedback to say that from some child welfare and attendance officers to say that the they searched, they found a model master plan, but it's not um, it's not updated. So there's some language updates that um, that were recommended, um, and those are in blue. And and uh, the first one was um, um, to align better with the um, I guess act that just passed and with the presentation that was just. Um, uh, presented that um, to add parental engagement, restitution, restorative practice, uh, behavior contracts, and alternative programming was a recommendation um, that was made by Mr. Frank Pasquale. Did I pronounce that right? Um, Pasquale. Uh, Pasqua, very um, famous child welfare and attendance officer um, who's retired, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and also, um, there's a um, language that should no longer be um, a part of this um, that's outdated and, um, and it's scratched out in red and it says um, in the two, three, four, first page, like the fifth, sixth paragraph, um, starting with the leadership team will review. Uh, basically, uh, there's the language of no child left behind. Uh, you know, and if you guys can, I think that, that uh, that's pretty outdated, that's pretty dated, you know, so, um, you know, just some common sense changes that, that probably need to be made to the cosmetics or the mechanics of, of the um, of the actual plan. And on the second page, same thing, the no child left behind needs to be taken out of there. And those are the, um, and I guess the last page is just simply um, a mechanic issue with um, with capitalization of, of uh, compliance. So um, that's the, um, the update. Um, in terms of recommendations, revision recommendations for the model master plan. Okay. Do anyone on the council have any comments, um, questions, concerns as it relates to the master plan? Okay, so I guess I can stay, I can state mine. Um, it's a four-page document, and I had quite a few um, issues that I saw with it. So if we look at paragraph one under positive behavior support, I questioned um, who were the individuals on this team that were no 504, uh, Section 504 Rehabilitation Act and IDEA law and how to implement it. Um, because you do have on here that you wanted individuals such as uh, parents, bus operators, food service workers, et cetera, on that team. But how many of those individuals actually really know that law, right? Um, including the parents. And I'm not saying not have them. I'm just asking, where, you know, should consideration be given to have someone a part of that team that actually is well versed in knowing those two laws? because you do have to think about that this uh, school master plan is going to impact and affect individuals with disabilities as well. Um, as it related to uh, paragraph number two, I wanted um, an explanation uh, for the referrals by the students. What did they mean by referrals from uh, by the students and referrals by the grade level? Um, because it's, it's mentioning that, but is the master plan supposed to be something that's implemented throughout the year, or is this something that's supposed to be revisited every year and then that's when the child is supposed to have a consequence? Um, if you go to paragraph number four on that same page, I asked who will ensure that the policy does not violate the civil rights and the federal laws as it relates to any of the students because um, some the students with disabilities have federally protected civil rights that I don't think that a lot of people actually uh, can actually know that OSEP have actually been making sure that they disseminate out um, as it relates to them and their parents. And so I think that that is something that actually needs to be considered. The very next paragraph, what is the consequence if the policy is not in line with the state and federal law? Because so many times we are posing a task with actually trying to put in place something, but we never talk about what is the consequence if they do not do this. 
So if they don't implement this, or if they don't do what they say that they're gonna do, what is that consequence? Who's gonna monitor them to make sure that they're implementing this? Um, that very next par paragraph talks about making referrals for them to go to alternative education programs. That's changing the site placement. And so I wanted to, I had the question regarding, are people really um, informed as it relates to the federal law regarding changing like the uh, site placement for the children that have IEPs? What about that MDR? Did you take into consideration having that MDR first before you change their site placement? And what supports were put in place prior to you actually wanting to change their site placement? These are things that should have been taken into consideration. That very next paragraph, I asked, uh, shouldn't the incentive program be implemented prior to the consequence? And would this be a violation of IDEA and Section 504 Rehabilitation Act? Again, um, that, that second page um, where it says each teacher, I asked what does this look like for children with disabilities? Because again, the master plan is supposed to um, fit every child. So we always have to take into consideration those, um, the children with IEPs and 504s as well. That next paragraph, that start off with the blank school shall design programs for students with special needs. I asked the question, should we consider doing this so that, should we consider doing a master plan so that it's uniform statewide? Because it is requiring for each school system to create their own model, but what about doing one that's uniform for the state so that the LEAs follow what the state put in place and that way it would be in, in adherence to the law. Um, if you go down to the paragraph that's right above parental, um, parental and community involvement, I ask the question, should we add language regarding um, 504 IEP students by considering their plans? Because each thing as it relates to the students their plans are supposed to be individualized specifically for that child. So when you're talking about development, uh, developmentally appropriate things, you have to consider that child's disability, the manifestation of that disability, and what that behavior is gonna look like so that you can really and truly create a plan for them as it relates to behavior so that the supports can be provided to the staff so that this child would actually be able to be in the least restrictive environment. Um, the parental and community involvement, that's required under Every Student Succeed Act, ESSA. So I asked the question about using ESSA funding because when we talk about parental engagement, there is a part in ESSA that talks about a percentage of funding from ESSA that, is supposed to, that each school system is supposed to hold for parental involvement activities. And I'm just questioning on whether or not that funding is actually being utilized for those type of events instead of muffins with moms, donuts with dads. That's not really uh, talking about behavior or anything that is, um, that is um, assisting a child as it relates to student behavior discipline or instructional minutes. So I'm, I'm wondering how exactly can we make sure that the school systems are utilizing that ESSA funding appropriately to make sure that the parents are actually being engaged on knowing what it is as it relates to behavior and discipline for their child, especially if they have any type of individualized plan. And then um, when you talked about the families, helping families and FINS program, I asked what are, what are, what are, where are the mental health programs? And it's if, if anybody is um, have knowledge of fiends normally being used as a weapon, because fiends is normally used as a weapon against our families, uh, fa disproportionately against families of children with disabilities and children that are black and brown. Um, I asked about cultural competent programs as it related to that. And I also asked, um, the paragraph that is before interagency cooperation of pending should not be used. The word pending 
because it says pending inclusion of mental health services. Pending should not be used. We, we do have statistics that shows that um, there was an exacerbation of mental health problems as it related for children and staff um, in, in the educational arena. So why not just include it? And that has anybody taken into consideration that there's a, there are billions of dollars that have been allocated by the federal government to actually address mental health and if this would um, and if the word shall um, should be required and then um, right before the paragraph that's right before student records I put what is put in place prior to the student being incarcerated um, is a consideration of adverse childhood experiences the 504 and the IEP etc taken into consideration because um, the, the adverse childhood experiences evaluation would actually allow a person to actually see if trauma is actually, if that child was exposed to trauma. And if anybody is uh, familiar with adverse childhood experiences, they know that children with disabilities are disproportionately born with a high ACE number. So when you do an ev ACE evaluation on them, their number is going to be off the chart. Um, disproportionately to regular ed students. Under student records, that first paragraph, I asked for uh, a definition regarding authorized person because authorized person could be left uh, to, for anybody to interpret as they want. But if we clearly define authorized person, then that would make sure that the correct individuals would actually be receiving those education records and not just any um, person from off the street. The part that's under, um, that's the third paragraph under that, that says a student or his or her parent may inspect the education record in accordance with the Federal uh, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Also, the law that should be added is Louisiana Parent Bill of Rights. Because the Louisiana Parent Bill of Rights Act allowed the parents to actually be able to actually inspect those records within 10 days, whether they make their request verbally or um, electronically, etc. So I think that that may um, need to be added. And then under visiting teacher child welfare and attendance, I put what is put in place if the family did not receive any document from the school entity or if the school did not complete any documents? And what if the IEP reflects absentee, but the district failed to do their part? And I'm stating that because you have um, a lot of children with IEPs that may have their medical diagnosis put in their IEPs so that it would trigger child welfare and attendance to know that this child will actually, may actually have uh, absenteeism at a much higher uh, number than, the, than their um, counterparts. And if that, if that IEP plan is not provided to the attendance person at that school, then that student will actually have absenteeism reflected uh, against them and that child would then be faced with truancy, that family will. And so that's something that I thought that everybody should want to take into consideration. And last but definitely not least, under statements of compliance, I put where is the exception for the children with IEPs 504 and is this provided in other languages? Because um, under IDEA, it actually states that our families of children with disabilities are supposed to be provided this information in their native language. So if that family is not English speaking and you have a parent that is uh, whose uh, native language is Spanish, then this document is supposed to legally be provided to them in Spanish. And that will go for, ch the, for the families of those that are deaf and blind, et cetera. So that means making sure that this information is provided in Braille, that you have an American Sign Language interpreter present, et cetera. So we have to make sure that when we're providing information like this and we're doing a master plan that is supposed to actually um, be disseminated statewide, that we're making sure that it is impacted and affecting every single person and that we're not leaving, leaving out anybody. 
I don't know if everybody look at the uh, stats like I do, but Vietnamese and Arabic are tied as number three of the languages that are, that are uh, predominant in this state. We do know that on our welcome sign, it says Bienvenue en Louisiane, which is French, because we are a French state that falls up under the Napoleon law, which is French. But sometimes we just don't think about that we have parents that are not fluent in English and that, are being ne that will be negatively impacted just like their children, because their children may be uh, learning that native language at home and only get exposed to English when they come in the school arena. So those were my recommendations. If anybody else on the uh, council or board wanted to have further comment or discussion as it related to it. Y'all don't have to all be quiet. I know I gave a, a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for Uh, to paragraph number two, where you're talking about the decision making model. On page one? On page one. I'm okay. Going to jump on, that. on page one, where you question the decision making model, you went down to questioning referrals by students. What, what was your concern there? Okay, so my concern was how exactly do we expect the child to make a referral? So, so what, what referral, so, and I'm going to use my, my child as an example, okay? Um, considering that I'm a parent of a child with disabilities, my child has multiple disabilities, but my child is also nonverbal and has maladaptive behavior. So if we asked my child to make a referral, my child couldn't. Um, but also, I have to look at, look at the staff that actually works with my child. So the staff that work with my child don't know American Sign Language. So that's a barrier right there in its own. Because my child, if he could make a referral, would probably ask for the staff to be educated in American Sign Language as well as his communication device so that there would not be a language barrier for him so that it, it would not exacerbate his maladaptive behavior. Because children with disabilities that are not verbal or that have a communication barrier, they fall through the crack and they disproportionately exhibit behavior. And it's always, and it's mostly because they do not have a way to actually express how they feel or their needs, desires, or wants. So that's why I was questioning the referrals and exactly how that child is supposed to make that recommendation or their referral of what they, what they are asking for or what they feel that they may need, who are they supposed to make that referral to, what is that referral supposed to look like, and what is the time frame in, in which that referral is supposed to be implemented. Okay. I'd like to attempt to provide clarity here. Yes, uh, ma'am. Because what this paragraph is referring to is that you're talking about the data management system that the schools use. Now, a number of the schools in Louisiana use J campus. And so where you see um, the school data collection, you see that third sentence where it says school data collection shall include but not limited to? All of those points that are referenced there, uh, separated by commas, those are data points within the data uh, management system. So referrals by students is a data point that's just going to show the administrators how many referrals are in the system according to students. So it's not asking students to make a referral. It's a data point that's pointing out these are the referrals per student. So Terry has five referrals for this uh, month. We used to do what's called a monthly trend where you're collecting these data points. And so it's just going to tell you how many students, how many referrals that a student has collected during that time frame. And that data is used to determine how the school administrators are going to use, move forward in offering additional behavior support. Right? So, for example, uh, 4, 7, and 10 are usually your, your benchmarks that we look at when you're working with students with disabilities. And so at that fourth, if a child has four, uh, we'll say suspension days, but 
that those referrals, that, that report actually gives us the information we need to offer additional support. So let's say we're working with children with disabilities, or any child for that matter, but for children with disabilities, if a child has reached the fourth day of an out-of-school suspension, then of course, we have a discipline continuum that we'll complete. But if that discipline continuum prompts us to go to that basic IEP, to make sure everything in that basic IEP folder is intact and that is being followed. So there are checkpoints in place to make sure that children with disabilities are getting the services they need. And these are the data points that we typically look at to ensure all students are getting the services they need. So these data points for most districts are looked at monthly. And so when you see referrals by students or referrals by time, referral by time is a data point that we look at to tell us what time of day are kids really, you know, where are the problems, right? And so usually for those of us who are in school, we know it's lunch. Right. Referral by location or referral by staff, typically that data point is used to tell us which teachers are making the most referrals and it lets us know where to offer additional support to the teacher. Because it tells us how many referrals she's putting in, the type of referrals he or she is putting in, the time of day they're putting in. Because it may be a certain period we may need to send the administrator over there. Because it's usually fifth period, you know, after lunch. So, these are data points that are covered in the data management system, and they are used to include all students. And can I add to that? Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Simmons. And, and that's why I, I, I can appreciate the diversity of, of this particular council because, you know, there, you know, some of us who work directly inside of the school systems and, and, and these local systems and on the, on the district level who um, understand these, uh, these uh, these mechanisms and these systems that way. And I, um, just to add to your point, I just sat in, I think it was with you, Mr. Perudum, uh, uh, on a district level, they actually went through the, the data points and did just what you speak of. And, um, and to pinpoint, um, you know, what student groups um, are we, you know, do we need to focus on or what, what's happening here with this? What, what are our um, uh, most significant offenses and what do we have most of our OSS? Um, I think Mr. He led the meeting, and then that trickles down to the to the building level. The same philosophy. So, um, so again, I just wanted to um, that just shed light on the need to have a diverse group on a council, so that those those kinds of um, you know that kind of discussion, those points can be taken into consideration, and that clarity can be made. So, um, thank you guys again. Can I make a comment? It sounds like a lot of the comments that you made are substantive. That that is um, revising the model versus updating it on the agenda. It was just an updating to remove outdated information and grammatical, not substantive changes, pretty much. So my question is for today, because we're going to be going in on whether or not we continue with this in-depth discussion by actually looking at that in back for um, revision of the plan or do we just go forward to do the updating that is on the agenda for today? I can say um, thank you uh, Judge Grover for, for that. I, I, I think that it's safe to say that we could just focus on the updating but in terms of the the, um, the um, discussion in terms of the substance of the ma um, yeah. model master plan um, ironically um, in our next um, our breakout groups which we probably going to defer, but that's what we're going to talk about. How can we make this a living document, right? And, and how can we um, really touch on those things that, that Ms., uh, some of those points that Ms. Corley just brought out, um, we can look at this and, and, um, and, you know, discuss changes that we want to see made, you know, as we go to, and, and guided by actual data. So, um, so those conversations are going to, to happen, right? If I'm hearing you correct, but um, I, I think for now and for this particular meeting, um, yeah, this this is just about the uh, just um, the revisions that need to be made in terms of the um, the mechanics. Yeah. And um, I, I do kind of have the look the question. Um, you know, I thank you so much, Ms. Simmons, for your comment. Um, I'm aware that J Campus sometimes have hiccups, 
and J Campus sometimes will have will reflect information that's not necessarily accurate, um, and that J Campus give us uh, problems with accessing it, just like Sir has been giving us a problem with accessing it. Um, but when we have those problems and those hiccups, what is what does the school system do then um, as it relates to tracking the data, collecting the data, and actually uh, being able to say that this information is correct um, versus that this here actually might have been messed up because we had a hiccup in the system? That, that's a good question. Now, typically, we look at students who are what we would consider being black or students with five or more Right. So when you're looking at your referral on a monthly basis, it's five or more referrals. So if you, um, once you identify those students, then you look at their discipline history. And if you see some discrepancies there, or you know, where it says, well, this child has five referrals, but really you only see three, you know, there may be a calculation issue, you know, in the system. And it's, not, it's a data management system, but it is human led. So it's only going to be as accurate as the person operated of course but you know and this again this is not punitive this is actually being proactive so this information is used to help the child to identify who needs additional support not to not to punish so if you do identify a child with five or more referrals and you say this baby needs additional support but as you look closer into their background you realize hmm, we got some errors here some of these referrals are we may need to take a closer look at it. So then you, you know, then you take a closer look at it, and if the information or the data doesn't warrant moving forward with giving the baby support, then you go on to the next child. Yeah, but it's more of a support too. It's not used uh, to punish. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does, and it leads me to the another question, which would be, um, I know that it's in um, one of the bulletins. It's either fifteen or eight. Of 1530 or 1706, where it speak about the discipline on how the children can be suspended multiple times before they're actually finally, uh, before an evaluation can be uh, uh, triggered by the school system for a functional behavior assessment to uh, give that student a behavior intervention plan. Would this uh, master plan be intercepting that bulletin portion as it relates to that? Or would we still have to wait on the student to actually be uh, reprimanded by the suspensions uh, that many times before they actually are evaluated or looked at by this master plan? Because that, that wasn't something that I could clearly definitive answer when I looked at it at, with me knowing that that's actually in the bulletins. And I know that most of the school systems always go and look, defer back to the bulletins that LDOE has provided. But that was something that I was actually um, considering. And I was like, okay, well, I don't see where it says that, hey, you know, the children are suspended this many times. So then do we go and look at this plan or do we do we follow what the bulletin says? Uh, if the child is suspended, um, I think it's like four or five times, then it triggers for them to actually be evaluate, have a functional behavior assessment to yield them a behavior intervention plan. I, I do know. Um, that school systems are moving and are, many of them have moved to, um, you know, I, I, now there is something that uh, says that specifically in the bulletin about how many times a kid is suspended and then this um, step has to take place. But there, uh, many systems move to, I mean, through SBLC, through um, uh, student assistant teams, and they um, are designed as preventive measures as far as uh, before it even gets to that point. So um, whereas a student assistance team would be on a weekly basis and this team would um, look at um, risk factors, you know, that are occurring and then they will bring this kid up and, and, and those determinations are made that way, which is, which um, is not waiting until the problem, if I'm hearing you right, the problem, waiting until the problem happens. So that's what you are concerned about, and that's, that is a concern. Um, how do we get to the kids before do we wait until the kid gets suspended this many times? But the, the, the systems are moving towards, um, you know, relying more so on the SBLC for preventive measures to prevent uh, 
to uh, minimize that, that issue or, or to not wait until the kid is reprimanded so many times before, you know, um, he's, he or she is put up for, um, you know, to be evaluated. And you're looking at, and then we look at a couple data points. We have referrals, the number of referrals, but then you also have the number of out of school students a day, right? And so keep in mind, as I explained earlier, you know, you're looking at their day, the number of referrals coming in, five or more referrals. Well, those referrals could be around talking. You know, it could be minor or major referrals, but we still, as uh, Mr. Perry said, we still do an SPLC meeting on those students to come together. The school building level committee will come together and decide. Sometimes at that fifth referral, no suspension has occurred, right? So, but sometimes at that fifth referral, and anytime you're dealing with, with discipline, you're gonna have a behavior specialist in that SPLC meeting. Sometimes when you're addressing those behaviors, the SPLC committee may agree to move forward with an FBA, a functional behavior assessment. Because remember, that's just an assessment. The results may not yield the child needing a behavior plan. You're just collecting data. So if you, you can do an FBA really at any time at the parent's request. I've had parents to call and say, you know, we can do an FBA because we've got some concerns going. And it is just a data collection process. And so sometimes during that, during that progressive disciplinary plan for the child, you may get to an FBA before a child is even suspended, right? So you, through SPLC, you, you may get, and that's the purpose of student by referral, right? Referrals by student. You can look at the number of, of referrals they have and put some interventions in place before it gets that far, right? To prevent suspension. So it's, it's a prevention. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's the direction, though. And, and that, yeah, it's preventive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's layers of protection. You, you have people within the school, and you have at the district level coordinators who are assigned to schools um, from the SPAD department and five to four, and they all watch this data. That's what that data is there for, and they may get also, uh, including your CWA also was, you know, and how many suspicious kids are getting or what's the problem? Let's look into this. And, and that's actually the role I serve. I provide district support. So I do look at monthly statistics on the students that I serve. And that's when you go in and you coach administrators on how to put those preventive measures in place before it gets that far. Does that answer your question? Or address your concern? Because this complements what's in place. It, it complements it. Yeah. The, the master plan complements the policies or the bulletins that are in place on discipline. So it actually gives the school a blueprint for managing. I think it kind of, in a way it, it answers what I'm saying, but in a way it still don't because I still have the, um, it still gives me pause as it relates to the children with the 504s and IEPs. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that may be, um, not just in my role of being a parent of a child with a disability, but also being around advocating for individuals with disabilities in the school arena where I can see that one school system may implement this master plan one way versus another. And, and so I think that um, the, the language uh, may need to just be tweaked a little bit I don't know, Mr. Mr. Rocker. If I, may, I know, uh, I know you're good at it. <laughs> Not to throw you out there like that, but I know you're really good at it. And so, and, and so that's why I'm, I'm saying, uh, Ms. Winkler, you know. Conversation, but it seems like it needs to be in a format where it can be an actual recommendation. I 
Yes. And so, so I like where this is going, but I would recommend to the chair that this could possibly be an, uh, be an item, full item on the agenda. And the recommendation would be we, you, we do these updates, or uh, the recommendation is, you know, something else. But we need to address these before the audience, before our you know, time is up. Okay. Do we have any public uh, comment on on this topic? I'm yes. going to Do we have any public comment on this topic? Thank you so much. And I uh, have we have with us uh, Deputy Chief of Policy for PBR and uh, Mr. Wright Toast, who's one of our directors special ed. He oversees directly the behavior side with our behavior strategy uh, MPR team. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much. Um, any other public comment? I, I would say this Wait, um, Mr. Prudhoe. I, I, just before you go, sir, I, I guys, I, I apologize. This is a, a bit um, off uh, task, but um, but Mr. Um, Mr. Prudum has been um, a part of this council, right? For how many? Um, uh, for I don't want to. Uh, many years. <laughs> so, but uh, when I came into this uh, this. Role. I mean, Mr. Prudum was one of the first people that I, I met, and and, um, and I saw him in action in his own district, and um, and I know that he's retiring, and um, and this will be his his last council meeting uh, with us. So before he ease out of the door, um, you know, because I know that our time has been well spent, Mr. Prudum. I just like to say, and I know I speak on behalf of everyone here. Thank you so much for your service, sir. It, it's been a pleasure serving with you. And, um, and thank you for everything that you've done for children over the years. This is, uh, touches my heart. The uh, well-being of all kids are very important to me. And I will retire and move away for a little while, but I'm not going far. <laughs> thank you. You got that right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Prudum, for your service, and we do appreciate you, and we always welcome you to come back to the Student Behavior and, uh, and behave, Student Behavior and Discipline Council. You always, uh, uh, you're not a visitor; you're always family here. Thank you. Uh, back to the discussion. Did we have any more public comment? Okay. Now back to the council. I apologize. Mr. Okay. Craig? I have a question. I would, um, just in case I'm not in the next meeting, I would like for somebody when we reach this to ask about how the data is being collected because the data, I hear people keep talking about data, 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 and we analyze the data, and we get the data, and that's how we make decisions. Um, the data is what the implementation is based on and, as far, and the teacher support, because I know as far as the referrals and the referral process, um, I've been with EBR for over nine years, and I've had the opportunity to work at several different schools in several different capacities. And the way that the referrals are being handled from the point where I've had um, administrators just tell the children to go home and not come back for three days, so that means the referral is not being written. 
Um, I know that the policy is that within 48 hours of the teacher writing a referral, um, that there's, it's supposed to be triplicate form. And you know, the teacher gets a, like a pink copy and the parents get the yellow copy and the white copy going across, something like that. And then you get, a, you get whatever the administrator, the consequences are, they're supposed to give that back to you for you to keep in a file for your records within 48 hours. And I can tell you, in the nine years that I've been here, I've only gotten maybe two back. You know, and that was from the same administrator. Um, and then also, I've heard administrators say, like, a, a t student might threaten a teacher or, you know, attack, like, maybe throw a chair or something like that at a teacher. And then the administrators say, oh, well, we can't suspend him because he has letters behind his name. You know, or something to that effect, which I do know you have to take steps, and it may be few more than the one that are in mainstream classes, but those steps still need to be followed, you know, in order to secure the safety and of the teachers and the other students and everybody involved. So um, I guess I said it to say um, the numbers and the data that you may have is not a direct reflection of what's actually going on in the school. and and. The way, I don't know how you can get it, maybe um, go to some of the troubled schools and talk to the teachers and they'll tell you, um, I wrote this student up 19 times, you know, and he's still in my class, you know, or something like that. Um, and then um, the, the last thing I wanted to say, I think I slipped my mind, but um, just, just basically, I think with the data, it's kind of like, you know, with a take home test. <laughs> You know, it's not that you're not going to get the same results as the test that's being monitored or proctored in the classroom, even though it's the same test. Oh, I know what I'm saying. And then, like at, at a school, my school that I work at is a middle school. And in the seventh grade alone, we are missing the, a math teacher, the science teacher, the history, and the English teacher. So that's all four core subjects that that grade level don't have. You know, we either have no teacher in place at all, or we have substitutes coming in every day. So of course that's going to lead to some behavior problems, but what is that doing for the education? And I said that to say, um, we're saying, oh, we have these teams in place, and they're going to do this, they're going to implement that. Where is, what is the team going to be comprised of? Because my plan here is used to cover a science class. I'm a Spanish teacher. I'm an after school athletic director. I'm a soccer coach. Um, you know, and I do several other things on the campus. So, you know, and I started a teacher support team myself so that we can work together and to bring up the morale and to stop the flight of all the teachers leaving. But even then, I have to beg the, the teachers because after staying for two hours grading papers or, you know, calling parents, now I want to meet with you just so that I can help you. And that's not even in the official capacity. I just did it because I figured I was a bad kid in class and I kind of know, you know, how to reach them a little better than someone who didn't get into trouble in school. But anyway, I, I basically wanted to, to see so that we can get real data, real data, so that we can base the information and the support on what really needs to be done. Because I know at the end of the school year, the principals, their job is on the line and they're afraid. And, and nobody wants their name on the screen saying that we had 6,000 referrals written, you know. But if those are legitimate referrals, if you have a highly qualified teacher in that classroom, and that teacher is following all the steps and the protocols put in place, and everything is being done, and their last resort is to write a referral, please don't throw it in the garbage. You know, so of course you won't really know that unless you really, really get down to the, the grassroots of the, of the thing. So you may have some data, and I think your intentions are 100% pure and, and sincere, but if the data you have is not accurate, it's doing no one any good. So in case I'm not here, which I don't need to say being here, I would like that to be proper. <laughs> I, I thank you so much, Mr. Craig. You'll probably be back. <laughs> and I think he's, the, he has very valid points. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what, what I don't know, happens in my head, because if you know my story, I live in a world of optimism and I come to work every day on a uniform. <laughs> so in my head, it's the data points that are being saved, but we're also taking into account the culture.
healthcare climate uh, surveys that should be done in our schools. So we're gauging what the students feel is happening, what the teachers feel is happening, what the administrators feel is happening. So that, uh, and also taking into account qualitative data that we don't need to see if we get it points. So I appreciate what you shared. And it's like, how do we make sure all three of those things are happening that can actually address and, and, and get to the point of making sure that the data, we, data that we're seeing is actually as uh, truthful as possible. Okay. Yes. Very briefly. Very briefly. To your point, well, first I do want to point out that in this plan, we are talking about using a data management system. So there is a system, and like I say, the J campus is typically what school parishes do. So you're absolutely right. We're only going to know what's put in there. So the start is to using the system. But I will tell you, based on personal experience, you will know eventually who's not putting in referrals. Because at some point, that teacher's going to want to release you. The behavior in that classroom is going to become so overwhelming, he or she is going to want to release that. And typically, what happens, that cry for help would drive us in said, well, okay, you're saying that uh, James, you've written him up 19 times. Well, I only, I only respond to that because I can't, legally, I can't start working with a child unless the data supports me going into the school, right? So if nothing is put in the system, I pull up the child, I'm in my office, so, okay, James, the name sounds familiar. I came in, nothing. So from where I sit, James is a great kid, right? He's spelling, but he's a great kid. He doesn't have a behavior problem. And the teacher says, well, I've read him up 19 times, but where are those referrals, right? And so my point is, if the data is not in the data management system, at some point, that teacher is going to look for release from that child. And that is where the person who are responsible for giving the release, who, who work really is data driven, they're going, to have to act, they're going to ask for that data. And so that will start the teacher. Typically, that starts the teacher to put in data. Oh, we run into all types of stuff. Even principals telling teachers, don't put in referrals. Bring all your referrals to me. Well, you we know, can't. Sometimes we don't, we that don't happens. have access to, like, uh, J campus, we use that. We don't have access to the uh, discipline screen as a teacher. Right, but see, so, that is where, that is where you, you really limit your ability to provide support. Right. But, but. Once that need is so great and you start wanting to call in folks to come and help you, that's typically what generates that move in the school to start putting in your data. I've had to sit with many principals and let them know referrals don't count against you. They're worried about their caps. Referrals don't count against you. It's the suspensions that we start to look at, right? So if you put in the referrals, then the support folks will get flagged. So we're looking at this stuff. So if you put the referrals in, you can get the additional behavior support you need before you get to a suspension. Yeah, and guys, look, I, I know it's, it's uh, I mean, this great discussion. I can, I can talk about this all day, but it's, it's going on 1230, and we have to get the, uh, the meeting dates out of the way. And um, and we, uh, I'm, I'm recommending, I, can I just go, make a, go ahead and make a motion to defer the, um, the um, Breakout session for small group discussion um, until the next meeting. Okay. Um, but I can assure you guys that the breakout sessions uh, that we're going to engage in speaks to everything that you guys have just talked about the equity and, and equity and looking at those uh, specific student groups and uh, making recommendations per the model master plan. So it, it's going to encompass a lot of the things that we've already discussed. So I was pretty excited about. Uh, <laughs> Going through that today, but I but I think that um, I think that we're right where we need to be. Okay, and, and um, so the next meeting, I hope I would invite. I hope everybody comes back because this we're headed in, in a positive direction. Just hearing the conversation. So the breakout sessions are going to be um, specifically about what the points that you guys have have made, which uh, which is um, which is which is wonderful. Um, so we're gonna I, um, so move that we defer. Um, Item number nine to the next meeting.
Can I have a second? Okay, and uh, consideration of the 2023 council. Oh, I'm sorry. And so, just to um, just so the, for clarity, um, item number eight, we will resume communication on that at the next meeting. And um, item number nine will be um, addressed at the next meeting. So, um, item number ten. Consideration of the 2023 council meeting dates. Um, do I have a motion? Okay. So that's first by uh, Ms. Simmons, and you second it, Ms. Boudreaux? Yes. Any uh, comments, discussion? Yeah, just, I, I do just for clarity, date number four, y'all will put it in bold uh, because it was the 16th, but it uh, had to be moved to the 17th um, for uh, space purposes. And um, so um, and, uh, that's when, um, you know, room will be available for us. So that date is um, is changed to the 17th, which is what you guys have in front of me. Any comments or discussion or questions from the board? I would like to make the recommendation for the dates to be different. Um, considering um, after reviewing the reports um, from the previous meetings, um, the what I was wanting to recommend was that um, the meeting in February, keep that one, but the meeting in May um, move that meeting to April. The meeting in August, move that to either June or July. And the meeting in November could be moved to September or October. And if we need the meeting date in uh, the fifth meeting date, then that would allow us to have that at the end of November so that there's not a conflict for the um, education staff that uh, actually work in the education arena because right now they're dealing with uh, trying to get students uh, prepared for Christmas break um, along with those that may want to attend that are college students. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of things tend to happen in December. Um, so you said September to Okay, so I could say it again. Um, keep the February date. But date number two, instead of having that one in May, move it to April. Date number three, instead of having it in August, move it to June or July. Date number four, instead of having it in November, move it to September or October. And then the tentative meeting date for number five, instead of having that in December, move that to the end of December. I mean, the end of November. How many meetings is the committee required to, how many times are we required? We're legally required to meet a minimum of three, but um, a minimum of three. However, um, we have been stagnant for the previous years due to a lack of quorum. And also, we're not. Uh, we're supposed to make recommendations to uh, Bessie in the House and Senate Education Committee. And if we move those dates to the dates in which I'm um, reference, I'm making a recommendation for, then it would allow us the opportunity to still be on task with what Bessie is doing, along with all of the other commissions that they have, as well as being um, in, being in line with what the task force for student behavior, discipline, and mental health is doing so that we can make a real true collaboration and effort to be able to provide real true recommendations before the last meeting that the Senate and House Education and Betsy have in December. 
I attend too many meetings. My apologies. <laughs> that, but that, that was the reason why I, um, I wanted to kind of propose those dates. And because we don't have a quorum, we really don't have, um, we really can't legally yeah. um, actually make that change. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that that was my, uh, the recommendation that I was going to bring back to the February 17th meeting. So that that would allow everybody to be able to check their busy schedules to make sure that, you know, um, that a date would be suffice um, in those months. And everybody could actually, um, I actually even considered um, and made the recommendation to Mr. Perry about having the council um, actually have like a little poll to actually make sure that we can uh, see what dates are actually more um, available for you meet your availability so that we can actually know what date to have a meeting so that we can have a quorum to be very productive, but um, it, it, it kind of interferes with them actually being able to secure the actual room, um, which is kind of the problem. I guess my, my concern, um, in the interest of my time, <laughs> um, if we're required to meet, three times a year, and we're looking at meeting five, which I understand since we have been kind of stagnant, I my fear is that adding additional meetings would decrease, um, maybe put us in more of a position whereby we don't have a quorum. And I know for me, I live inside out, so it's it's a commute for me to come here and, and then us not to be able to have any forward movements. So, that's just something for consideration. I, like, I'm not sure if adding more meetings is necessary, necessarily the factor. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll do what I can, but I don't want to be a barrier in that there's just so many times that this group meets, in addition to the three other education department of ed meetings that I attend, in addition to LDH meetings, so it's, it's a lot. So I just, that's my fear about that. Um, I would rather us have I would even prefer to have, a, you know, a two and a half hour meeting that's productive than to have an, an additional day meeting. So it's just kind of my take on that. If I'm going to drive here, I'd rather just spend the day in Baton Rouge. So do we want to defer this um, for further discussion yeah. maybe during the next um, the, well, the I next think meeting? This is, oh, I'm sorry. No, that, that's fine. No, go ahead. I think it may be a good idea if you poll oh. everybody, just because I'm thinking about my council's meeting. And like the the months that um, Chair Corley has put out there, April is our council meeting. We have a council meeting in July and October, so I don't necessarily know if those will be good months for me. Yeah. Um. So it may be a good idea just to poll the whole group. To yeah. See remember we we polled the last time, and 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 it, yeah. uh, so we'll we'll uh, and that yeah we'll we'll try that again. And. Um, would, because I'm, I'm, I'm listening to both of you, and Ms. Haven, no, I, I attend all the DD Council <laughs> meetings. Um, so, um, oh, as well as Mr. Rocker, he attends them too. So, <laughs> um, so that, that would, that would be a few of us that wouldn't be present, um, along with entities from the state that attend those meetings. Um, but would it be beneficial for us to consider, um, having, the option for um, council members to be able to attend the meetings virtually. So I, I think um, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. Okay. And, and I was just asking if it's a consideration. Is it yeah, consideration? Um, but I don't think um, virtual meetings for, for um, appointed members, it's my understanding from my, from my, for the program that I have to run, that for participating members, it is not an option to attend virtually, but you have a virtual option so that public can participate. That's my that's my understanding of the open meeting law and, and that law that was passed. So um, so I don't know if that's something that we can really entertain um, having a virtual meeting, you know, a virtual option for members. So, but I mean, it's definitely something we can discuss next time. I can I can check. <laughs> Right. Um, but uh, the resolution from last year didn't actually make the legislative change even more. So 
more of a, more of a suggestion that we should do this. Right. Uh, but that we need an actual statutory change uh, to do this. Uh, for the yeah. 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 Which is a change because I've read the quote once that we've got to to do that. But uh, I think it's not a big question. Okay. So. Um, I mean, we can't do anything today, anyway. Right. No, we, we, we can't. Seems like we're look, talking about a lot look, of things that we no, can do. No, we can't. But, but in, in, the, in the spirit of trying to get things up to be productive, I did take quite a few notes <laughs> um, to, to make sure like, that... Um, the different dates on, the, on that, on a doodle bowl and, mm -hmm. and just see what comes back. Right. right. You know, I mean, I think that's it. In preparation for the discussion in February, say here's the results of the doodle poll. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any problems with these meeting dates? Yes. I think that could be something ahead of time. Mm -hmm. We don't need to spend 30 minutes. <laughs> that, that will work. And, and just um, to give context, in the reports, it does show that this council used to meet six times, um, six times a year. And um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that when we uh, put five dates, it was because due to COVID, that was when the um, council reduced to meeting only three times, um, which the law does state a minimum of at least three times, but the council did used to meet six times. And so um, trying to get the council to meet five times is just so that we can be productive and actually do what um, is written per law uh, for this council to actually do. Um, the task of doing, and and so um, I I trust me I definitely. So my uh, recommendation would be instead of more frequent meetings, just longer meetings would be my recommendation. You know, if, I mean, because truthfully, if if I get here at ten, um, and leave at twelve, I there's not really a whole lot I can do on either end of that for me personally because of two <laughs> hours traveling. So I would rather stay till two you know, um, and, and get work done than to make another trip out here and spend four, four hours traveling for a two hour meeting. So yeah, I, I think that we have to defer and, and just have and that And so I think that could be another poll, you know, would right. you, you know, two hour meeting versus four hour exactly. meeting, you know, half day, okay. part day. Like I think that would be um, helpful to know. Okay, any other? Comments, discussions. I appreciate I, I, I everybody. Like solution oriented here. I, I don't want to do the same thing and keep getting the same result. Right? Look, look I, I appreciate all, all, all this conversation, all the dialogue. Trust me. So, well, I'm pretty open. I need to know because sooner I know, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same thing. I'm, I'm going to spend the day here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, anybody, and we will, um, Mr. Perry and I will work on trying to get that um, poll out to y'all. Mr. Perry, do you think uh, before the beginning of the new year? Yeah, I think we can get that poll out um, as soon as possible, so it could definitely be before the beginning of the year. Okay, so we'll try to have that poll to all the council members before the um, beginning of the new year. Um, also, I'll type up the notes, um, the notes from today's meeting, um, so that Mr. Perry can provide that to y'all as well as um, the PowerPoint presentation from today um, for your review, so that you can have along with um, Mr. Perry and I will um, try to work on the um, agenda for the meeting in February. If you have any suggestions or recommendations of topics to be put on the uh, agenda for February, please email Mr. Perry or myself, um, um, including if you want presentations, um, email Mr. Perry or myself um, so that we can include that on the agenda um, to make sure that we have a real, true, meaningful and productive meeting so that we can do the best work um, possible for the students in Louisiana as it relates to behavior and discipline. So do I have a motion for a journey? Oh, well. I have one more recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Um, as we talked about um, members and if we need to decrease the size or whatever, I, I think another possible um, question is, are you interested in continuing to serve on this committee? So then that way you're not 
kicking anybody off or you're not saying, hey, you haven't been, which I have said to people like, hey, you haven't been to the meeting in a while. Do you want to participate any longer? And sometimes it's like, no, I don't have the capacity and thank you for asking because I didn't know I had a way out. You know, so I think maybe, I mean, you know, I think it could be a, a softer way of doing this, you know, that people always try to just it uh, was, uh, but basically, it is a, if, I don't know if under state law we can change the procedures here to require a smaller number of percentage more quorum. That could be something we could possibly look at. If we're allowed to do that, I don't know legally where, where the requirements are in the state meetings. Yeah. In talking with Nikki, one of the things we can actually explore is not being specific on where people are coming from, but just capacity for the role they feel, like an advocacy group versus the specific advocacy. Yeah, because yeah, it looks like there needs to be a high school principal, elementary school, and, 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 and so if we just say we, we need, we want 11 school, eleven school representatives, yeah. and we want, you, you know, if we say we want five school representatives, five parent groups or community groups, and not just saying, oh, we want to choose, what like, we, you know, yeah. pick what community group said that they want to be a part of this, and now that they got what they wanted, they're gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and they can still participate as public. Exactly. I, 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 I actually have to reduce the size of my group, that of my council, because of the same thing. Like, if we had all these people so that we can get everybody's input, but they can get input through public comment. They but that's something you can bring up, definitely, if you, if uh, Madam Chairperson wants to put that on the agenda, uh, what is it? making a recommendation on how we can define this group leg legislative the next legislation. Yep. There's a group. Great. Right. Okay. Um, you guys are some real troopers. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out get angry now. <laughs> Any other comments or concerns? <laughs> Ms. Boudreaux, I love you. You don't have to feel like that. Trust me, I think Ebony feel like that sometimes with me on the council meetings. <laughs> Any announcements anybody need to make? Today's my daughter's 30th birthday, and I'm here. <laughs> Tell her happy birthday. Okay, so do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Mr. Th uh, Rocker uh, gave first. Do I have a second? I second, please. Ms. Boudreaux. Well, I, I hope that everyone have a safe and wonderful holiday season. And it's a pleasure seeing y'all faces today. And I look forward to seeing y'all 